Now, as you know, we've been going through, we just started our series um, two weeks ago. So Beck opened up for us a few weeks ago, and Joy had preached for us last week as well, um, focusing on this idea of this upside-down kingdom for the next, yeah, I think one, one more week with Pastor David will be closing with that as I, I share our next part. And I did share a little bit in those that were at the well for that one too, a little bit on, on, on the idea of what that upside-down kingdom looks like. And I guess before we get into it, I kind of want to just understand more um, about this idea of this text that we read in Matthew 5 from Miller. And I don't know, I've shared a story here when I was at Easter camp, um, but I, I've had a lot of things go at Warner's Bay. I, I don't, don't think it's the space for me. I've always had bad, good things happen there, great memories with, with a lot of, um, yeah, I used to go there quite a fair bit after church when I was at Wall's End here and when I went to Charlestown. But yeah, coming here at night, I just don't recommend it. But <laughs> I've shared that one with the story, nearly getting mugged there. But there's, I've had another, another story when I was here, and I was here with my mates, and we were enjoying celebrating. I think someone had just finished something. It was so long ago. But I just remember one of my mates was just in one of those moods, and I don't know if I share this part, but we have this game where we used to wind, and if you wind up your arm and they were still in the way and you hit, there was like no penalty. There was no lashing back. Now, I'll say it was his fault, but it was probably mine as I reflect as a, a young dad now, <laughs> if my sons did that. But I remember I did this to my mate, and he just wasn't in the mood. And so after I did it, it was just a light one. I thought it was light. And he turns around, and he just whack right in the middle, right there. And I'm down, and I'm trying to catch my breath. And so I had to, two options. I'd either fight, think, oh, I'm so angry. Or I'd be the bigger man and i walk away. Now, what do you think I did? <laughs> Are you stereotyping me? Or <laughs> no. Well, you know what? I was ready to throw a punch. I remember I was about to throw a punch. And I just remember just feeling, oh, walk away from this, Adam. Walk away. Don't cause a scene. You probably started, even though he reacted that way but you need to walk away. And so I did. I walked away in a half. I was angry and I just had to walk away or something. There was going to be a point of no return, I think, with that friendship. So I walked away. And I think we all reach situations where we're into this idea of a fight or flight. And I think that one was a very, very black and white sort of response in that scenario. But I think there's times like when we're driving in the car and we hit that certain person that cuts us off or someone's doing 80 in a 100 zone. Yeah, we've all been there. And you can either be like really angry, honking your horn, or you just patiently wait thinking, you know what, maybe they've had a day. Maybe they haven't seen the sign, you know, that flight response. And I'm sure we've all had it as well when it comes to other things in life where we can either react in a very aggressive way or we can just go, you know, know what? I'll take the higher. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just fly. It. But I guess as we read that text here, this is what we try to live by, this upside down kingdom that it is a normal human response to fight, to get revenge, to find justice, whatever it may be. I will sue you. I'll do this or this and that and the other to find some form of balance, to get some closure on this, on this ordeal that has happened to me. But then Jesus comes in, and I always find it ironic. I don't know about you, just a little pause on this, but I always find it just really, I can't do it justice. But whenever I preach on this sermon, it's like I'm preaching of the Sermon on the Mount, of the best sermon preacher in the entire universe, and here, little old me, I'm trying to give it a bit of justice. So I do have a disclaimer that Jesus did this better than me, <laughs> but I'll try my best to unpack a little bit. Anyway, unpause. But here Jesus responds with this, say, you have heard it. This is what we did, that, hey, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, and we've already read before, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. And if if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other also. So I think I'm more of an imagery sort of guy, and I think this is an awesome opportunity where I know maybe there's a lineup, I don't know, but I was thinking of potentially showing an example of this. What do you think? And there were two names that popped in my head. I'm going to let you decide who we slap. <laughs> I'm going to ask Pastor David or maybe Lloyd Turner. Who, who do you think would be more satisfying to, I mean, just to show an example of the sermon, I should say, to, for this illustration. Any, any takers? Any votes? Any vote Pastor David? Anyone vote Lloyd? I'm sorry, Lloyd. I think the, the tribe has spoken. It was an official business action as well as the interim chair. Would you like to come to the front? Now, do you think I should have the, I mean, the, the, be the example of hitting him or should we get someone else at the front too? Oh, you know what? I guess there's more writing. I might lose my job, so maybe I'll do it. No? Can I just give a shout out to online church? It's really good. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's 3D, so you need to come in and see it. <laughs> so nonetheless, as we read this, it tells me that, hey, what do I lo do, Lloyd? So once I slap you in the face, psh, that's what they do in the WWE, if anyone, sorry, spoilers. <laughs> so Lloyd has shown us the perfect example of what to do. What was that? Turn the other cheek. Now, let's keep focusing. 
And like, if anyone wants to see you, take off your shirt and hand over your coat as well. Go on. So, but Jesus said this, not me. No, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there. We've got kids in the room. <laughs> but can we give Lloyd a round of applause? You're next. <laughs> And so I guess at face value, we're seeing this response that is unnatural. Usually for me, I just want to fight. But here it's telling me, when I read all of these verses here in Matthew 5, there is something completely revolutionary, something that is completely upside down. And so I want to focus on this, and we've got three things I want to focus on. And each time I bring up an example, I want you guys to go, mmm. Can we go, mmm? Mmm, the three M's, the mmm. I think that was the old Macca's ad back in the day. <laughs> Anywho. <laughs> but I think when I look at this, the first thing I focus on, and I read this at face value, I automatically think of the word meek. Would you agree? The idea of being submissive, and I guess for those that don't understand the word, by definition, we can see it's like humble, patient, quiet in nature, as an under provocation from others. But I kind of like the idea when I read this verse that maybe, maybe the, uh, the second definition fits a bit more, don't you think? Overly submissive. Do you think this is what Jesus is trying to tell us? That, hey, when someone hits you, let them hit you again. If someone wants to sue you, let them give him everything. If, hey, if they want you to walk one mile, go the extra one. Is this what Jesus was trying to teach us about the upside-down kingdom? To be meek. And I guess to give you a little bit of more context in this, when, when it's shared there at the start, he says, you've heard it so that an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, he's actually talking about the law of Moses. Because for them, they themselves had to, you know, we know they came out of Egypt and they've reestablished, if not started an establishment of what the government looks like for their, their tribe of Israel there. And so one of the things was, hey, you know, usually it was payback, 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 and it escalated to the point where people were like killing each other to finally find revenge. And usually there's never a clean 100% transaction, 100% transaction, it's all good. But it's like, hey, I don't know about you, but when I, I grew up with a sister, it was a bit different. But, you know, when one of us hits one, it's like, hey, you, are you, are you hit me, so I have to hit you back to make it even. But it's never even. I'm looking at the other boys with brothers in the room, Yeah. It's never easy. You throw a little bit extra, maybe an extra knuckle in there, right? And then you're like, hey, man, you hit too hard. Now it's my turn. Push. <laughs> hey, that was way too hard. And then it just keeps going back and forth, and it escalates to something even more than just the punch back and getting that peace. But in fact, it gets to the point where people were just losing friendships, in fact, losing their lives. So this is why Jesus said, even here it's so eye for an eye, but Jesus brings something revolutionary. And in fact, that wasn't really justice, if you ask me, but I think I like the way that it's worded. I think I've got it as a slide here is, oh, not yet, but it talks about being an idea of a limited revenge, that in fact it, it limited the revenge to get payback before it escalated to even more than something like that. And so when I understand this a bit more, I still think, well, are we, in fact, are we meant to be meek? And I kind of ask this question, as Christians, we should refuse to descend to the level of the aggressor and return evil for evil. And I guess this was the whole of Jesus' crux of this idea, that, hey, going from the dramatic, hey, get your revenge, but in fact, he was flipping something entirely on its head. Hey, don't stoop down to level. Don't act like humans do. You are in fact now part of something new, something fresh, this new upside down kingdom. You need to live better because, hey, I am here and I have shown you and I've already paid for all the payback that needs to be done and I'm going to die on the cross for that. And so therefore, hey, now you no longer play on the world's game anymore. You in fact play the game of the kingdom now. That, hey, now you need to turn the other cheek. Now you need to give up your cloak. Now you need to walk the extra mile. And I think, yeah, I did kind of jump a little bit ahead, but I guess the idea of what Jesus was trying to fulfill just in a very quick sentence is while Moses limited revenge, Jesus taught the abandonment of vengeance and its replacement with loving kindness seen in action. But it still begs the question for me, this idea, are we meant to be too meek, to be too submissive? I guess... Are we meant to be pushover Christians? Don't you think? Do you think this is what Jesus is trying to teach us here, to be pushovers? Why not? <laughs> I guess that's why we're here to discuss this a bit further. But I guess at face value when we understand that, hey, turn the other cheek, an eye for an eye, you know, all this sort of stuff that we've just read. In fact, are we actually just meant to roll over and just be pushed over and treated that way? And I guess with that, is the goal to look like the victim? And I guess why I think of this is sometimes, and maybe just going a little bit further, sometimes we think being a martyr of something means we're doing the right thing sometimes. And it justifies, hey, I'm doing the right thing because people are telling me that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. But in fact, maybe they are actually wrong, but they're using it as a justification that, hey, 
Maybe I'm playing victim here. I've done the right thing. They are in the wrong. And they use this as an excuse to play victim sometimes. And so I kind of think of that sense. But I guess just to finish off this point, I think, does being meek mean being weak? Being submissive? Giving up to everything? Is being meek means being weak? I want you guys to go, hmm, again. That's right, we're two-thirds now. Aren't you happy for lunch? (laughs) But I guess there's another angle we can look at it, looking a bit more at the context. And I guess the understanding that Jesus wasn't just someone that just submitted, but Jesus is incredibly smart. He's the smartest man in the universe, right? And so he was playing a different game. I remember, does anyone recognize this in the room? I'm sure some of our basketball guys here. Broadmeadow Stadium. Do I recognize it? No? I think it's Broadmeadow Stadium. I Google, I Google anyways. <laughs> but anyways, I remember back in the day when I was playing at um, Broadmeadow Stadium. Back, back, I don't look like I play now, but back when I was at school, and I joined a team, an after-school team. And we had this coach, and he used to um, coach teams that uh, players that used to be in rep basketball. And one thing he kept doing, so whenever we played basketball, we'd always, always get to the point where I think it's very easy that you start playing the other team's game, and all of a sudden they're playing a bit rougher, which means then you play a bit rougher. A few elbows are thrown in, so then you start throwing elbows in, and you yourself, with the game speed, f- speeds up, you speed up. And so one thing my coach would always constantly tell me is, hey, stop playing their game. You need to play yours. You need to slow down, play your style, play your game, and let them come to you rather than you going to them and trying to cater to the game that they're used to playing. And I think of this as the same thing when it comes to God's kingdom. And so with this idea that, hey, we've got to stop playing at what the world is playing, but play what God wants us to play. And so this is how we kind of unpack it in this sense. So... Maybe we'll give Lloyd a bit of rest. Maybe Pastor David, would you like to come to the front? You said I damaged a horse last sermon, and I haven't forgot in that (laughs) that the horse collapsed at the beginning of the race. I'm just wetting my hand because I heard it hurts more. Um, Like the tea towel. You know, you dip the tea towel before you go. You didn't do Yarra. Never mind. That was the secrets of Yarra happening. Ain't that right, teens? Block your ears. It's more for the staff. But here's an interesting point. Jesus was smart. Why he picked this analogy and why he picked this, and he's exaggerating in a sense, but also trying to prove a point. That, in fact, when we slap with the right hand, and the Bible text tells us when you slap like that, or sorry, backhand, sorry, yourself, you're showing dominance in that sense of the hand. And all of a sudden he says, turn the other cheek, right? And so I have an option. I can either do it open hand right, which we'll get to in a second, or the back of the hand, which means you're more dominant than the person, is to slap him with your left. But as you can see on the screen... The left hand was used for all those, you know, unclean things, right? Going to the toilet, whatever it may. You know what? Well, back culturally, and those who have been in third world countries, you know what it's like. I've been there where they say, don't shake their left hand. <laughs> that was a warning I got when I went to Nepal and a few other countries there when I served. But what he's illustrating is here is, hey, turn the other cheek. Because now not only are you, like the position of where David is, where he's being dominated, he's being disgraced, now something has changed. It's changed now to the aggressor as the one showing shame. Does that make sense? And in all cultures, in, in, especially in Jesus' time, let's give Dave a round of applause. Thank you for coming up, mate. It was so, I had to hold on to the Holy Spirit there not to hit you. <laughs> <Nah>. <laughs> but the idea that, hey, if you yourself were seen to use your left hand for anything, actually the shame and disgrace would fall on the aggressor. Does that make sense? And so you see that even though we're looking at the idea of being meek, now we're looking at the individual. And the funny thing when you read that text, it doesn't say that your neighbor or anything. It actually says the enemy. If your enemy does this, this is what you need to do. And this whole part of the chapter here is about your enemy. And so it's in fact, it's putting the enemy in a very difficult place that it's not only revealing that, hey, he's being dominant over to the person that he's hitting, but now, in fact, now that the the, the non-violence approach of the one being hit has now thrown the ball in his court and said, hey, if you're going to hit me again, you're going to show everyone that you're a monster. Does that make sense? And so we get to the next part of the passage too, that walking the extra mile, that one makes sense. You know, you're already carrying a lot of, of the soldier's gear. It's quite heavy, you know, their armor and their spears, whatever. And you're carrying it and it's tiring and it was part of the law for them to carry it. So if they were requested by a soldier saying, hey, carry my stuff, they were by law, were, had to do it. But to walk an extra mile would actually make the soldier look like a monster. And then we get the text with the cloak. And I'm sure this one makes sense. Is in fact, hey, if they're just suing you for something, 
give them not just what they're suing for, but give them everything. Give them everything that you have. Take off your cloak. Give them that, which then makes you naked. But funny enough, in Jesus' time, again, when you look at the deeper context, that when you make someone naked, it actually brought shame upon the one that was making you naked. Does that make sense? Because there were biblical laws to protect those that only had a cloak because the cloaks themselves were actually their blanket, the very thing that they would sleep with. And so there were Jewish laws, or if in fact even in the Bible in Deuteronomy as well, actually said, hey, if you're going to sue someone, you can't take their cloak because that's their very place that they're going to stay warm. It's going to give them comfort in the night if they don't have a home. So don't, if you're going to sue someone, you do not take their cloak. But isn't it just ironic that Jesus pushes it just that little bit more, the extra mile, and now he's pushed it extra with, hey, give him everything. Because now, even though you're exposed and naked, you've given everything you can, it has revealed more of the person suing that they are, in fact, what? A monster. That something is being revealed to them. Their character is, in fact, a monster. So I pose with this question when I think about this. Are we meant to make our enemies look like monsters? <laughs> to be meek is to be a victim. That's probably not the right approach, is it? But being a victim means then someone has to be the monster, does it not? Because you can't have a victim without the monster. And so does being meek mean, hey, we're meant to make them look bad. They're our enemies. Aren't we meant to make them look bad and then rally up against the man or whatever it looks like? Are you following me? Is this what Jesus was trying to propose in this? I don't think so. <laughs> but I guess... Being meek reveals others to be a freak? Does being meek reveal others to be a freak? Was this what chapter 5 here was telling us to do? To show that we are weak. To show that they are a freak. Was this truly the intent of this text? But I guess all in all in understanding it a little bit more, Jesus' nonviolence approach reveals the deeper character within, not only for the one being hit or the one being sued or the one walking the extra mile, but it actually reveals the character of the one initiating that too. Does that make sense? It reveals more of their character, that they are a freak, that they in fact are a monster, and no one in society likes a monster. And so was that Jesus' intent? Hmm... That's right, this is the last one. You failed all three. That's okay. <laughs> but meek, monster, or maybe, looking at it further into this lens, maybe, maybe, knowing Jesus being a God of love and mercy and justice, maybe there's something more to this text than meets the eye of just being a monster. But in fact, Jesus wanted us to somehow show mercy. And this is the reality in our final point here. Everything comes down to choice. And when you look at this story, rather than the victim saying, I give up and plead, they are doing something that puts the ball back into the court of the aggressor. Would you agree? That, hey, all right, I'm going to turn the other cheek. What are you going to do now? Hey, you've sued me for this. Do you want this too? It's up to you. Hey, I've walked a mile. I'm going to walk another one. Is that all right? And then with the aggressor, the initiator, now has to make a choice on all three of those situations. And in fact, as we saw, we thought maybe they're trying to reveal that they're a monster. Yeah. All right, I'm going to slap you again with my dirty hand. It's going to, but in fact, it shows I'm more of a monster. Hey, I'm going to make you walk that extra mile because it's above the law. You know what? Stuff it. Walk another one. Or hey, I want everything that you got, even the cloak that you keep warm at night, and you're going to die now. But in fact, this is what Jesus, I truly think, meant when he talked about this parable. Now, Dave, come back up again. Now, we shared half of the story. So we firstly, remember, backhand is dominant. Boom, right hand. I can't use the left hand because what, it makes me a monster, right, or a freak. And so I don't want to do that. Well, the second choice is what? To use your open hand. To slap again this, I'm not going to hit you, for the record, but off the record. <laughs> but using your open hand, actually in the Bible times, meant that you were their equal. So if I hit you with my open hand or fist, that showed that I saw you as an equal worth fighting. Does that make sense? Backhand meant dominance, which means I'm the higher power, or my left hand also showed dominance, but being a monster. But turning the other cheek, when we look at it, is with an open hand, actually, ironically enough, means to show us that someone is, in fact, 
you're equal. Does that make sense? Thanks, Dave, again. Sit down, mate. But then what about the mile? Well, the soldier himself, if you, if you walk one mile, which was law, but if you walked an extra one, guess what? The soldier would get in a lot of trouble if you were to walk two miles, and they found he'd get in a lot of trouble for doing that by Roman law, who was the authority at the time in Jesus' time there. And so they, in fact, had to go, hang on a minute. Do I force my power to walk him an extra one? He's offered it to me, and now the ball's in my court. I have to make a choice to either, hey, make him walk an extra one, but then I'm going to get in trouble, or, in fact, what? Show him mercy. Yep, one's enough. Have mercy. And I think this one's an obvious one, too, as we know, as we kind of backed it in the monster part, but the nakedness would be an embarrassment, in fact, to the viewer. That, hey, even though he's naked, the one that's making him naked actually gets embarrassed by it. And so, in fact, the soldier actually has a choice in this. So it's actually not so much about the meek, I don't believe. I think it does in an extent to how we deal with things in a violent situation to how to make it non-violent, but not submissive either. But in fact, it shows us on how deep Jesus was thinking with exaggeration as well. We don't take it all literally, but the exaggeration and unpacking it further, that in fact, Jesus has placed the ball back into the court of the aggressor or the initiator, that they now have an opportunity to either continue living in sin and being a monster, or now their hearts are now opening to one of the characteristics of Jesus, which is mercy. And in fact, now they have an opportunity to show mercy by not slapping them, but showing that they're equal, or not taking all their clothes and letting them keep some of it, or in fact, not only making them walk two miles, but one. Now the decision of opening up their heart has now become towards the initiator. They now have a choice. And it's crazy to think about. You think, oh, evangelism is very black and white. But no, Jesus goes further and deeper in understanding that, hey, there are going to be scenarios where you're going to be persecuted, that you're going to suffer. And he says there'll be times where you need to fight or flight. But in these scenarios here, there is a non-violence way to approach these things that, hey, it doesn't make that you are the victim. But in fact, it allows the aggressor. To not only see grace, but to choose grace. Are you with me? To show mercy by not slapping them again, but showing them that they're unequal. By not taking all their clothes and by not making them walk two miles, now the ball is in the court of the aggressor. Now they have a heart that can potentially be open for Jesus to do something. Don't you see? And I don't know about you, but that's one of the best evangelisms that I've seen work in my ministry and other people's ministry too, is just showing grace and love. And the only thing people can respond with is ignoring it or thinking, seeing, going, wow, they are living like Jesus taught. They are living like Jesus lived. And in fact, that is the response of Jesus through these non-violent approaches. The initiator has the choice to either be a monster or open his heart to mercy. And to finish, does being meek mean being weak? Does being meek help reveal someone else to be a freak? But I actually think Jesus' whole intention around this whole passage is understanding. And even looking at the very next part of the verse, it tells us to love our enemies. We want to unpack that now. He tells us to love our enemies. So why would he want to make them a monster? But in fact, he wanted an opportunity for those soldiers to experience his mercy as well to open their hearts to allow Jesus in. And sometimes being put in a hard situation that forces you to do something like that is what we need sometimes. I'm not saying go out there and, 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 and make people submissive and this and that and the other. No, no, no. You know, it's like, oh, I, I bug my sister so that she can have more patience. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. <laughs> if you know what I mean, there's loopholes. But that's not entirely true. But in fact, I think the whole intention of what Jesus was doing here was that being meek opens the opportunity for others to seek, to see a non-rebellious side, to see a Jesus that is non-violent, but knowing that, hey, Jesus has already paid it all, amen? He already suffered on the cross, and he didn't do it to be submissive, even though he was as a servant, but he did it because, hey, forgive them, Father, for they do not know what they do. And he died for them because they didn't fully understand God's love. They didn't fully understand who he is until they were put in a tough place to make a decision. And in those little small instances that we've shared in chapter 5, this is a time where we can put the nonviolent approach where we can not only practice to grow in our own meekness, but in fact it is an opportunity of evangelism to allow one of our enemies to make the decision to show mercy, 
to allow Jesus in their heart, to allow their conscious work and realize, hey, I don't want to be that monster. And really, it's either you're a monster or you're going to follow Jesus, isn't it? <laughs> and so I believe in this whole passage that all of us, we always have a choice, fight or flight. We get to make a choice for Jesus on how we interact, how we react to certain things. And I'll tell you what, uh, <laughs> being a young father is situations where you're, I don't know, all of a sudden you're yelling at your kids, you're getting all emotionally high, and I reflect in those really crucial moments in my life thinking, is this the type of person I want to be? And I feel embarrassed about it, but I have to own it. And I think to myself, what do I need to do to be more meek? And I think in those crucial moments, like the soldiers would have, when they hit and the reality hits that they could be a monster, they have to make a choice of what character they want to be. And I believe that's in all of our lives. And I'm sure you guys have your scenarios where, where the rubber meets the road and you're forced to make a decision to be that bad person or to be someone that's made a bad choice or, in fact, to follow and let Jesus humble your heart, to let Jesus to soften your heart to make that choice. And I've been there. I'm not saying I'm perfect, but it's a constant daily journey. And so we see this just in this passage here, that just something is nonviolence by turning the other cheek to show, hey, what are you going to do? Or giving up all your clothes to put the embarrassment on the aggressor or walking the extra mile to get him in trouble to reveal that, hey, you don't have to be a monster, but hey, let Jesus in and you show mercy. And in reality, when we do that, when we're submissive, <laughs> if that's the right word now, that we understand the text, being meek opens the opportunity for others to see Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to say thank you, Lord, for who you are. Lord, for the challenges that we go through. Maybe the frustrations that we face in day-to-day -day life, whatever that looks like for all of us. But Lord, those are the times where we either fight or flight. Whether we choose to continue being a monster, or maybe we've <laughs> that one choice has made us look like a monster, or do we in fact want to change that behavior through your Holy Spirit and allow you in to make our hearts merciful, to make our hearts loving and soft and humble, to be meek as you called us to be. So we'll be with us in all of our different challenges with our enemies, but to be reminded that we're there to love our enemies. And Lord, sometimes that's the harder path. It is. But we don't live by the earth standards or game anymore. We live in the upside down kingdom, which is to show grace and love through nonviolent approaches. So be with us, Lord, to be meek allows others to seek. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.